Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We are going to discuss two of the sonnets of Edmund Spencer, a proper Elizabethan poet like Sidney. We will begin with certain points about the historical context and the literary context in which Spencer wrote his poems. We will try to understand why Charles Lamb called Spencer the poet's poet. We will examine what this Spencerian sonnet is by which Spencer was able to create a name for himself. The sonnet sequence that we are examining in our lecture is Amoretti. It was published in 1595. We have selected two sonnets, sonnet number 67 like as a huntsman after wary chase. Sonnet number 75, one day I wrote her name upon the strand. Let us go ahead. Spencer wrote at a time when Queen Elizabeth was ruling England. That was a time of exploration and conquest of the new world as represented by another courtier of this time Sir Walter Raleigh. He was that is Walter Raleigh was a good friend of Edmund Spencer. Queen Elizabeth fashioned herself as a bride and monarch of England between 1558 and 1603. It was a time of jubilation as English naval power was at its height. It was able to defeat the Spanish Armada in 1588. Though the constant conflict with people in Ireland and others did not subside completely. There were many poet courtiers as ambassadors and officers of the Queen or her deputies in different parts of England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland and many other parts including the continent. Let us see the literary context in which Spencer was writing his poems. There was an urgent need for writings in English. There were many strong advocates for the use of English in literary writings. For example, we have two great humanists, Richard Mulcaster and Roger Ascham. As the educational outreach for commoners like Shakespeare, Spencer, Drayton, Daniel and others was easily available, many young people took to writing seriously. We also must notice that the rise of Protestantism and the rise of English go together. Actually, they developed together because translating the Bible into English for the common use of the people, particularly for people with various uh, viewpoints about the way in which they have to worship, that really was a great motivation for English to spread, education to spread to large parts of England. There was a competitive environment for patronage as well. Poets, writers and many others had to make a living by the support from patrons. As we mentioned earlier, Spencer is known as the poet's poet. This epithet was given to him by Charles Lamb, the 19th century essayist, poet, critic even dramatist. Ever since then he is fondly called 
the poet's poet. Spencer is remarkable for these two qualities, sensuousness, mellifluousness of poetry. We could see the images very clearly, we could feel the ideas, feelings in his poems very clearly and also we could see the smooth flow, the musical flow of language in his poetry. Such a great poet naturally influenced every other English poet, whether they are great or small, every one of them who wanted to write poetry vividly, picturesquely has always been influenced by Spencer. A notable example is Keats and many others for example, and many others. Spencer by his own contribution of a great epic elevated English literature to the level of European literature. His epic poem is The Fairy Queen published in 1590 and also in 1596. That is he wrote three books first and then next three books he planned 12 books, but he could write only six books in his lifetime. So, it is an incomplete epic poem, even then it could add value weightage to English poetry. For his friend Sidney, Spencer wrote his elegy Astrophel and mourned his death and also celebrated the great renaissance man Sidney. Such a great writer is considered to be one of the four pillars of English poetic tradition. Who are these four? Chaucer, Spencer, Shakespeare and Milton. Without these great writers, these four poets English poetry has no foundation. Every great poet owes something to these four great poets of England. What is this Spenserian sonnet? We have already seen this Italian or Petrarchan sonnet. We also noted the Shakespearean sonnet or English sonnet. Now, we come to the Spenserian sonnet, the sonnet written by Edmund Spencer. In his sonnets, Spencer used an octave and a sestet. He also used a volta in between, but interestingly, he had a rhyme scheme which interlocked with every other sentence. So, you can see the rhyme scheme like this A B A B first quatrain, when the next quatrain begins, it begins with the end of the first quatrain. So, B B C B C and again the third one starts with C, C D C D and the last couplet ends separately. So, on the whole a Spenserian sonnet has this rhyme scheme and it has three quatrains and a couplet. Amority is a sonnet sequence that Edmund Spencer wrote. Amority actually means a little cupid in Italian language. Obviously, cupid refers to the god of love. This is a poem about love. So, it is it is natural that we have a title like Amoretti. This is a unique sonnet sequence ending in marriage. It has three parts. First, it has 89 sonnets. Next, it has anacreontics. What is this anacreontics? Anacreon was a Greek poet. He wrote poems in a certain way. So, modeling him on the poetry of Anacreon, Spencer wrote a few poems and put them together in this volume. He also had another poem called Epithalamian, it is a marriage song for his love and his second wife Elizabeth Boyle. Unlike all other Elizabethan sonneteers, Spencer was one exception where he could celebrate fulfilled love in a sonnet sequence. We have selected two sonnets from the collection Amority for our discussion. The first sonnet is six, number 67. Like as a huntsman after 
where it says, it is an unusual poem of reciprocal love in the form of a hunter and a deer without the common negative connotation of the image of hunting. And the second sonnet is number 75. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. Again, this is an extraordinary poem about the power of poetry to achieve immortality for the beloved and for the poet. Here is the sonnet 67. Like as a huntsman after a wary chase, seeing the game from him escaped away, sits down to rest him in some shady place with panting hounds beguiled of their prey. So, after long pursuit and vain assay, when I all wary had the chase forsook, the gentle deer returned the self same way, thinking to quench her thirst at the next brook. There she beha beholding me with milder look, sought not to fly, but fearless still did bide, till I in hand her at half trembling took and with her own good will her firmly tied. Strange thing me it seemed to see a base so wild, so goodly one with her own will beguiled. We have the rhyme scheme also along with this poem. You can see the color coding of chase, away, place, pray, assay, forsook, way and the rest. The previous version of the poem that we read may look somewhat strange. Now, we have it in modern English. This was actually a problem in Elizabethan English and even for us the kind of strange spelling and things like that is still a problem, but here we have this poem in modern English. Like as a huntsman after wary chase, seeing the game from him escaped away, sits down to rest him in some shady place with panting hounds beguiled of their prey. So, after long pursuit and vain assay, when I all wary had the chase forsook, the gentle deer returned the self some way, thinking to quench her thirst at the next brook. There she beholding me with milder look, sought not to fly, but fearless still did bide, till I in hand her yet half trembling took, and with her own good will her family tied. Strange thing me seem to see a bee so wild, so goodly one with her own will beguiled. Wherever some changes have occurred, you see them in underlining like down, chase, vain, forsook. These words have been modernized for us to understand easily. The thematic contrast that we see in this poem is that of hunter and a game that is the lover and the beloved. It is a game of hunting of the game that is the deer that the poet indicates a little later. We have a hunter interested in hunting a deer. We also have the deer with, with reference to the lady as a fearless and, and also fearful lady. These two contrasting ideas of fear and fearless is noticed in the lady. On the one hand, we have a gentle, leer, gentle deer with a mild look. On the other hand, we also have a wild beast within the same deer and also within the same lady. The love of the speaker and the desire of the beloved, these two things are brought into this poem so successfully. Now, we have a question to ask, whose voice is prominent in this poem? Is it the voice of the speaker or is it the voice of the lady or if it is the voice of the lady through the speaker, how does he convey the voice of the lady in this poem? We can also ask a question, how can the speaker hunt his own beloved? Actually, the passion and the purpose the passion of loving and the purpose of hunting, they are at odds with each other. We also have another dimension to look at. The contrast is very clear here, that is on the one hand, 
we have this free will of this lady on the other hand we have something like predestination we can ask a question like was the lady destined to love this poet or speaker and marry him or did the lady choose the poet or the speaker on her own and marry him or agree to marry him. So, this question of choice and fate we have in this poem. There are interesting poetic devices in this poem if you look at them carefully. What we notice something very interesting in this poem is a metaphor is encased in an epic simile. That is why that is how the poem begins like as the first two quatrains deal with this epic simile and also the metaphor within these eight lines. Maybe Spencer indicates that the use of epic simile means or refers to the kind of epic love that he has for his lady that is Elizabeth Boyle. When we see the metaphor indicating the pursuit of love as hunter and prey, we notice some disturbance, but then the poem ends softly, smoothly, mellifluously with concord, with harmony. This harmony and disharmony, these are all brought to us through alliteration and also repetition. We have many alliterations in this poem, sit some shady, panting prey, thinking thirst, trembling took, strange seemed see, fly fearless, one with her own will. We also have repetitions in the case of beguiled and own. This deception, self deception, how do we look at it is an interesting case. We also have transferred epithet in wary chase, the chase itself is not wary, it is the hunter who is wary. We may also see the pun that is play with words, on the one hand we have wary chase and the same wary is used in a, in a different way in another phrase wary had the chase. Similarly, the word thirst, thirst for water or thirst for love or thirst for consummation that is marriage, these are all referred to with reference, to, these are all referred to in the context of the love between the speaker and the, and the lady. Let us examine the structure, rhyme and rhythm in this poem. We have three quatrains and a couplet. The quatrains are linked by couplets. Two couplets we have, one is BB, another is CC. And these couplets have some function of connecting one idea with another, one emotion with another, one image with another. The rhyme scheme goes like this AB, AB, BC, BC, CD, CD, and EE. So, on the whole we have three couplets in this sonnet. The rhythm can be noticed in the couplet that we have given as an example. There she beholding me with milder look sought not to fly, but fearless still did bide. We have this <coughs> iambic rhythm, there she beholding me with milder look sought not to fly, but fearless still the by the cesura that is a pause comes between fly and but in the last sentence, the last line that we have quoted from this poem. The overall impression that we have from this poem is this. The poem captures the picture of a love chase ending smoothly, successfully. No impediment prevents the lady from accepting the speaker. The lady initially tries to run away from the scene, but then she comes back, although 
she wants to drink from a nearby brook. Spencer creates a whole scene in 14 lines displaying his characteristic sensuousness and mellifluousness. Perhaps Spencer did not write his sonnet for the sake of fashion of sonnet writing at the time, but to express his own love for his beloved Elizabeth Boyle. Perhaps we can end the discussion of this poem with a question. Does the pursuit succeed when patience reigns supreme? We have to remember Spencer waited patiently because he was tired that is the poet was tired, the hunter was tired, he was waiting and the lady came on her own. We are moving on to the next poem that we have for discussion that is Sonnet 75. This is again a very interesting poem we can easily relate to. One day I wrote her name upon the strand, but came the waves and washed it away. Again I wrote it with a second hand, but came the tide and made my pains his prey. Vain man shed see, that does in vain assay, a mortal thing so to immortalize, for I myself shall like to this decay, and eke my name to be wiped out likewise. Not so could I. Let better baser things devise to die in dust, but you shall live by fame. My words, your virtues, rare shall eternize, and in the heavens write your glorious name. Where Venice death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live and later life renew. We see the rhyme scheme here on my right. We also have the couplets highlighted in red color, pray essay, likewise device, subdue and renew. We have underlined some words which are repeated several times. What is the thematic contrast that we have in this poem? The major contrast is between mortality and immortality. When we write the name or something on the seashore, the waves come and arrest whatever we write immediately that is the common occurrence that we have in this mortal life. The intention to write something on the shore says that we want to capture this evanescent life, ephemeral life at least for a while for us to see the beauty of writing our own name on the shore we want to see. So, the poem deals with this great question for all human beings. How can a mortal being subject to death can become immortal? This is actually a common element of the sonnet sequence and poetry in general. The waves may remove the name of the beloved from the shore. No one can escape that. The lady accepts it actually and tells the poet, she may accept her mortality and consider the proud poet's attempt a vain attempt, a useless, useless attempt, but then the poet will not accept the immortal condition of human beings. The poet promises to immortalize his lady in his poetry and claims that death can subdue everything, death can conquer everything in the world except his love expressed or described in his words for the lady that he loves. A number of poetic devices have been employed in this poem to convey this idea of achieving immortality in poetry. Achieving immortality through poetry is a conceit that Elizabethan poets or Italian poets are aware of. It is a common one and we also have repetition in words like wrote, name, came and vain. If you see the number of repetitions, you will see name is repeated several times. Probably drawing our attention to keeping our name alive after our death. Again alliteration contributes to this effort in immortalizing something mortal. Waves and washed pains his prey die in dust, where's your virtues, 
our love shall live and later life renew. One hyperbaton that we have in this poem is this, my words your virtues rare shall eternize. This is the line that we have in the poem, but if we rewrite in our normal English, we will see like this, my words shall eternize your rare virtues. But if we write a sentence like this in a poem, it will lose its charm particularly in this context for the sake of rhyming with another line. And also it is noticeable in the, we can notice in this poem about the different or strange use of eternize. We have a dialogue between the speaker and the beloved, although we have this dialogue the whole scene or is captured in the form of a narrative. It is a simple story that has been developed through a conceit, a common conceit of achieving immortality through poetry. Now, let us see the structure, rhyme and rhythm. There are three quatrains and a couplet and the quatrains are combined or interlinked through the couplets. The couplets have some function mainly to interconnect and also to emphasize the images which are used in the poem. The rhyme scheme is A B A B, B C B C, C D C D and E E. We can see the linking couplet and also the rhythm in lines 4 and 5 here. But came the tide and made my pains his prey, vain man said she that does in vain assay. Within these two lines we can see the rhyming couplet and also we can see the pauses within the second line vain man said she that does in vain assay. We also observe a masculine rhyme in the case of fame and name in lines 10 and 12 and through the dialogue we get to know the voice of the lady. On the whole we see that the poet takes us to a shore to inscribe his beloved's name. He picturizes the scene of writing vividly the speciality of Spencer that has endured his readers. The scene of writing is also a scene of fighting for immortality. It is the right of writing that is the right pursuit for the poet. We have a question to ponder over. Is writing then a ritualistic attempt to ward off death permanently in this impermanent world? Thus, we see the historical context and the literary context in which the poet's poet Spencer wrote his sonnet sequence using a special form of sonnet called Spencerian sonnet in Amoretti published in 1595 from which we have chosen two, cho two sonnets number 67 like as a huntsman after very chase and number 75 one day I wrote her name upon the strand. Spencer has contributed to English poetry through his sonnets and sonnet sequence apart from his main contribution the fairy queen, the epic poem, one of the earliest epic poems in English language. Thank you. We, we have some references as usual. If possible, you could look into them. Enjoy reading Spencer's sonnets. Thank you.